Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me OK? OK. Um, I have no conflicts to report. I guess that's the first way to start. Do you feel the power of potential when you walk into a patient's room? There's the potential for a great result, a wonderful team working together, building relationships, ideally building a community. But there's also the potential that things can go wrong. Someone can get hurt. The team cannot work well. That's the difference between what is and what could be. And in that space lies the power of potential. I'm a little obsessed with the power of potential because I've defended doctors and hospitals in medical malpractice cases for over 20 years. In every case, we have the potential to win and the potential to lose. The power of potential is everywhere. I once had a case where the jury was able to see that power with their own eyes. I represented a female urologic surgeon, one of few. Her name was Dr. B, and she was wonderful, empathetic, kind, and a very good surgeon. She had performed surgery on this patient, Ms. M, and Ms. M had sustained a nerve injury, a recognized risk of the procedure. But the plaintiff, the patient's attorney, said that Dr. B had performed the surgery negligently. And specifically, he said that Dr. B pulled too hard on the retractor. So the expert got up and talked to the jury and described the process like this. Dr. B pulled and pulled and pulled on this big metal retractor, and she hurt these tiny little nerves in Ms. M's pelvis. And now Ms. M will never work, walk normally again. I got up to cross-examine the expert. So you told the ladies and gentlemen of this jury that Dr. B used a metal retractor, is that right? Yes, these retractors are usually metal. And you said it was big. How big would you say this retractor was? Well, they differ, but they can be anywhere from the size of a ruler to the size of my forearm. Sir. Oh, I'm not moving. It's okay. I know because I, well, I'm right. That's, the jury was too. But let's see, if, okay, come on. All right, let's try one more. It's done. There we go. If I were to tell you that this was the retractor that Dr. B used in this procedure, then everything you've told the ladies and gentlemen of this jury is just plain wrong, isn't it? One of the jury members laughed. That is the best feeling in the world. <laughs> when a jury is laughing with you and not at you, you are having a good day. That juror was laughing at the expert, sure, but he was also laughing at the power of potential. A retractor could be a great big metal thing but it could also be this tiny little rubber thing. That's the power of potential. And I learned a whole lot from that case. I learned I have to be vulnerable in my job. I didn't know what the retractor looked like. I had to be willing to say to Dr. B, I don't know what a retractor looks like. Because if I hadn't, she wouldn't have told me. Why? Because she had the curse of knowledge. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later but I learned a lot about the curse of knowledge, and I also learned about the difference between what is and what could be. So I wanna do a little experiment with you where we explore that difference. On your table, you have a couple of objects. Hopefully there's enough to go around. If there's not enough to go around, I will get some from the other tables. This, and if you have paper, take it out because you need paper for this as well. So on your table, you have one of these, more than one, hopefully enough for everybody to go around. This is a pencil. This is paper. This could be a rubber band. So I'd ask you to draw your initials on the piece of paper. All right, I, we have to move quickly, so I'm just going to keep everybody drawing their initials on the piece of paper. OK, now erase them. No eraser. Anyone think of something that could be used as an eraser? OK, so 
in a psychological study with this, they took half of a group and they told them this is a rubber band. They took the other half of the group and they told them this could be a rubber band. Those who were told this is a rubber band, only 3% of them thought to use it as an eraser. But those told this could be a rubber band, 40% of them thought to use it as an eraser. That's the difference between what is and what could be, and it's just words. Now, many of you are trying the eraser, and you're saying, wait a minute, this doesn't work. It's messy. It's not perfect. Guess what? Could be's are messy. They're not perfect. They take experimentation. They take technique. Maybe you need another rubber band. Maybe you need a different piece of paper. But that is what could be is all about. It could be, for example, that women actually make better doctors. We know that studies show us that that just might be true. And researchers think that's for a couple of reasons. They think it's because women tend to be more empathetic. They think it's because women tend to be more detail-oriented. They think it's because women tend to be better listeners. Women tend to be better at putting themselves in other people's shoes. And I had a case where we saw how very important it is to put yourself in someone else's shoes. What I remember most about this case is the stairs. You see, normally when a patient sues a doctor, I take the patient's deposition and I speak to the patient about what happened. What's your injury? Tell me about your conversation with your doctor. Tell me about your pain. Tell me about your disability. And normally that happens in a sterile plaintiff's attorney's office with a court reporter at the head of the table, sitting across the table from the patient. But in this case, it was the first time that I had to go to the patient's row home in Philadelphia because he was dying. And I stood at the bottom of the stairs looking up at these narrow, dark, steep stairs, knowing that I had to climb those stairs and challenge this man a little. Because he claimed that my doctor had failed to diagnose his cancer. And he said that if my doctor had diagnosed his cancer, he would have survived the cancer. And now he was dying. But I had to push back a little because, you see, my doctor had recommended in the patient portal that the patient have an MRI, and he hadn't done so. So I knew I had to climb those stairs and step into this dying man's home and question him as to why he hadn't done what the doctor had recommended. I reached the top of the stairs. There were hospital beds. There were nurses in the room. There were all kinds of machines. And I sat down across from the patient, and we had a conversation. And I listened. And he told me about his, his life growing up in Philadelphia. He told me about his visits with the doctor. He told me about his pain. He told me about his anger. He told me about his fear over dying. And then I said to him, sir, why didn't you have the MRI that the doctor recommended? His answer, I didn't know what an MRI was. I had had an x-ray, and I thought they were pretty much the same thing, and I didn't want to spend more money on a copay. I said to him, why didn't you just ask the doctor what an MRI was? And he said, I was embarrassed. I didn't know what people were reading in the patient portal, and I didn't want people to think I was stupid. Now, I learned a lot from that case, and a lot about technology, which if I had more time, I could talk about technology forever. Because did you know that if you ask someone to do something face to face, they are 34 times more likely to do it than if you ask them on an email? Had that doctor asked that patient to have that MRI face to face, we might not have been there. But I also learned about the curse of knowledge. And this is something that I think that all of you need to remember as you go back out into your practice. This is the curse of knowledge at work. What am I humming? Anyone know? Very good. OK, so that's a really frustrating game because I feel like a dork standing in front of a bunch of women humming. But it's also frustrating because I know the song. And I know it so well, I can't imagine what it's like not to know it. I have the curse of knowledge. You have the curse of knowledge when it comes to medicine. You know it so well that you can't imagine not knowing it. When you use a word that your patient doesn't understand, their brain does not even process the next seven words you say. That's the curse of knowledge. 
And a great way to overcome the curse of knowledge is to use your team to help you to do that. Because your surgery schedulers and your front desk staff and your call center and your nurses and your PAs, they might not have the curse of knowledge the same way you do. They might not have it to the same extent you do. And so if you work together, you can easily overcome the curse of knowledge. There's one study that I love from Atul Gawande. He gave an interview at NPR, and he talked about the fact that if everyone in the operating room knows one another's names, complications go down by 35%. It's important to become a team, and it's important to know your team members' names because every member of the team has a different perspective that they bring to the care of the patient. And that team includes the caregivers as well, the people who are at home working with your patient. And perspective is really important. It's something that's a big part of empathy. To do a little study on perspective, I'd ask you to quickly, I don't want to take up more than my time, draw on your paper a picture of a coffee cup. And I'm going to come around real quick and just take a look at your pictures of coffee cups. Ladies are good, good artists here. Okay, so I have glanced at probably 10 pictures of coffee cups, and what I have seen in doing so is that you all drew the coffee cup from the side. I don't see any pictures of coffee cups from the bottom. I don't see any pictures of coffee cups looking down into the coffee, which is med medical students and residents. That's probably how you see it most often. You all drew the coffee cup from the same perspective. And that's fine, but it's important to know that there's other perspectives. There are always other ways of looking at your patient, your day, your relationships, your sleep schedule, everything that you have in your life, whether it's professionally or personally, there's always another way of looking at it. And sometimes that other way can be an improvement. One of the things that helps you with perspective is to include every member of your team in conversations. You know, there is so much study right now on team in, in economics and in business, and I do a lot of speaking to CEOs, and we talk a lot about teams. And one of the main things that they find that is the best thing for a team is psychological safety. Amy Edmondson is a researcher at Harvard, Harvard Business School. She's a friend of mine, and she's done a lot of research on psychological safety. Her husband's a doctor, so she's done a lot of research about hospitals and uh, nurses working together, and it's phenomenal research. And it's about the importance of psychological safety and how teams that are psychologically safe tend to do better. Google did similar studies, and they did this thing called Project Aristotle, where they took all their employees and said, who is making up the best teams? And they found that what the best teams were made of were people who had psychological safety. Now, Google said that psychological safety was two things. One, proportionate speaking. That means everyone on the team speaks as much as everyone else. So that would mean that doctors speak as much as nurses, speak as much as attendings, speak as much as residents, speak as much as caregivers. Important to remember that as you're working and communicating with your team. The next thing is empathy or intuition. That's that ability to read people's emotions, to feel their energy, to know whether or not they're doing well, to be able to put yourself in others' shoes. Now, I've added a third thing. This is mine, proportionate listening. Because if you're speaking and the other people aren't listening, how safe can you feel? And I think we overlook listening. We all want to speak so that others will listen, but we so rarely focusing on listening so that others want to speak. And that's something that if you do that with your patients, you are never going to see a lawyer like me. Because all kinds of studies, New England Journal of Medicine, Harvard, and if you want to email me, I can give you citations. These studies show that there's no correlation between negligence and lawsuits. The correlation is between communication and lawsuits. Wendy Levinson is the woman who did the majority of research on this phenomenal research. She's now partly retired. But if you go back and read her studies, you will see that tone of voice, making your patient laugh, listening to them, is going to be the best thing you can do to avoid lawsuits.
And listening can be fun. One study that came out recently that I've been doing a lot of work with because of the technology push and telemedicine push is a study that showed that you are much better as a human being at feeling another person's emotions and being empathetic on the phone than you are by, by video. And research th researchers think that this is for two reasons. One is that you are focusing all of your senses on that one interaction. So as long as you're not doing something else, sending emails or motioning to your kids to be quiet, and you're totally focused on that voice on the phone, you're best able to read their emotions. Another thing that they say is that we are better as human beings right now at hiding our emotions on our face and in our body language than we are in hiding it in our voices. So it's important to remember to listen to voices. When I do workshops, I often do an experiment where I split people up into pairs and one person puts on the blindfold. The other person then says something, whether it's, my name's Heather Hansen and I'd like to make an appointment, or my name's Heather Hansen and I'd like to buy a product, but they either say it with a great big smile on their face or a great big frown. And we see whether the listener can hear the emotion in the voice. Now, it's an interesting experiment because most of the time they can, but what's even more interesting to me when I do it is that the CEOs, mm, they're not always that good at it. The doctors, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. You know who's phenomenal at this? Call center people. The people who answer, so there's a big group here in Philadelphia that I represent and that I do this work with. And not only do they always get it right, but they look at me like I'm a moron for even having this experiment. They're like, who doesn't get this? It is really good to practice listening because you do get better at it. And that doesn't just mean listening to your patients and your PAs and your nurses. I have been here since Friday watching you guys interact with each other. And it has been phenomenal to see. Listen to each other. Work with each other. Network with each other. Because this is one area where women kick butt. So. The last thing I want to talk about is something that has a study that has one of my very favorite things in the world, so I had to include it, and that's champagne. There are very few female champagne grape growers. The majority of grape growers for the champagne business are men. And yet, it seemed that women were getting better deals. They were getting better prices on their champagne. They were doing better in their sales. And the people at Harvard Business School wanted to figure out why that was. So they did a study and they found out that the reason women were getting better prices for their champagne is because they were so much better at networking. They were sharing information. They were talking about the prices they were getting for the champagne. They were talking about the prices they were getting to sell the champagne grapes and they were talking about who had the better champagne grapes and who didn't. They were working together instead of being in competition like the men were. It reminded me of Octavia Spencer and um, Jessica Chastain. Do you guys all know what they did? So Je Octavia Spencer is an African-American actress, and they've been in some movies together. And with the whole Me Too movement, now there's a push to make sure that women are getting what, other w what men are getting. And Jessica Chastain wanted to make sure that she was getting what men were getting in this next movie. And Octavia explained to her that we African-American women are getting a whole lot less than you are. Sharing information, networking. And Jessica said, well, that's not happening here. We're negotiating together. And we're going to get the same price together. And they got, I, I forget the number, it's something like 500 times more than what Octavia normally makes because they did it together. And so continue the networking that you've been doing. Continue with all the talking that you've been doing and sharing the information and use technology for good in that situation. And stay with that conversation because as you do so, it's only gonna help to your benefit. You know, could be's are messy. Sex trafficking could be a thing of the past, that's messy. Gun violence, we could be finding some legislation that works, that's messy. It's not perfect, just like the rubber band isn't a perfect eraser. But I ask you, as you go back into your lives, to go out there and play with what could be. I can't wait to see what you do. Thank you so much for your time.